In this video, we're going to learn about the fourth and final major research design that psychological scientists use, experiments. Experimental designs are unique in that they allow you to finally draw cause and effect conclusions about what you're seeing. Experimental designs are research designs in which an experimenter manipulates a variable of interest to see if this manipulation impacts a second variable. Now, in all of our previous research designs that we've learned about, naturalistic observation, case studies, and correlational studies, we're simply observing. We're observing differences or relationships or whatever that are already out there in the environment. When it comes to experiments, though, we're actually creating differences. We're manipulating things and seeing whether our manipulation makes a difference. And if we do our job right, which I'll describe what that means in a moment, if we do our job right, we can reasonably infer that our manipulation caused the difference that we're observing, again, allowing for cause and effect conclusions. Some of this will become more clear as we answer the question you see here. What makes an experiment an experiment? Two key factors that I'll describe. First of all, random assignment of participants to conditions. So let's say, for example, that you're a researcher and you want to test whether a new medication is successful at treating depression. We saw a bad example of this before that didn't account for the placebo effect, which we'll talk about today, but let's go over a simple example that's actually a little bit better of a design. So you might start with 100 people, and your first job is to randomly choose half of those people to go into an experimental condition and the other half of those people to go into a control condition. Now, these two terms are very important, so I'm going to spend a moment describing what they mean. The experimental group is the group that receives the key manipulation, your actual treatment of interest. The control group is the group that does not receive the manipulation. So in the example I just described, the experimental group would receive the depression medication that you want to test, and the control group would receive a placebo that looks and tastes exactly like the actual medication, but doesn't have any active ingredients. It doesn't actually do anything. So the control group should be matched as much as possible to the experimental group, but it should be lacking that key treatment that we're interested in. The second thing that makes an experiment an experiment is the manipulation of the independent variable, as we just saw. The independent variable is what you're manipulating between the two groups. So in this case, either giving somebody an actual medication or giving somebody a placebo. That's your independent variable, the choice of who gets the medication. The dependent variable is what you as the researcher predict your independent variable should have an effect on. In this case, you expect that your treatment should help with depression, so your dependent variable is depressive symptoms or more generally depression. Now let's talk about that placebo for one more minute because there's a lot of interesting stuff. Placebo, as we talked about before, the placebo effect is improvement resulting from the mere expectation of improvement. And I want you to just think about this from the perspective of a psychologist, because this isn't something that's just in people's heads and it doesn't really have much of an effect. It actually makes a big difference and it results in real improvement. To illustrate, I'll go over three studies, just very briefly, I'll just give you the highlights, that illustrate the power of the placebo effect. In one experiment, we found that giving people higher doses of a placebo resulted in a, quote, more powerful effect than giving people lower doses. So again, this is an experiment. In the experimental condition, we gave people 40 grams, uh, milligrams, for example, of a placebo. And in the control condition, we gave people maybe 5 milligrams of that placebo. And the people in the experimental condition who received the higher dose reported stronger effects. But realize how amazing this is because both placebos are totally useless. In another study, they found that placebos injected through needles tended to show stronger and more rapid effects than placebo pills, as is the case with actual drugs. And finally, my personal favorite, in an experiment we also found that placebos that people thought were more expensive tended to work better than placebos we think are cheaper, which I think is just hilarious and also a real testament to the power of the placebo effect. All right, beyond the placebo effect, what else do we need to be aware of when we're doing experiments? That is, what are the other limitations that we need to be aware of? One big one is confounding variables. A confounding variable is any variable that differs between the experimental and the control groups other than the independent variable, other than your key manipulation of interest. As an example of this, let's go back to the depression study that we were working on earlier. Let's say that instead of randomly assigning participants to your experimental and control groups, you simply put all the men in the experimental group and all the women in the control group. Well, this is a problem 
Because now if we do observe a difference, right, let's say that depression was better, symptoms were reduced in the experimental group. Well, now if we see these results, we really have no idea if this is because of the medication or if it's because of gender, gender in this case being a confounding variable. We already know, for example, from other psychological studies that women tend to show higher rates of depression. So if we see more depression or worse depression in the control group, we don't know if that's because the control group only got placebos or because it's all women. And again, this is why it's really important to make everything equal and similar between the two groups other than that key manipulation of interest. All right, I'll talk about one more thing to be aware of when you're doing an experiment, the experimenter expectancy effect. This is the phenomenon whereby experimenters' hypotheses about the study lead them to unintentionally bias the outcome of that study. The experimenter expectancy effect goes by many names. One of the most famous is the Rosenthal effect, named after a classic study that sort of inspired us to sort of figure out that this effect uh, exists. In this classic study, it was with elementary school teachers, and what they did is they gave an IQ test to all the children in this elementary school at the start of the school year. And what they did is they never told the teachers the IQ score results of the children, but they randomly assigned different labels to be applied to these children. So about 80% of the children in the school were labeled as just normal children, and about 20% randomly selected, again, it had nothing to do with their actual IQ scores, 20% were randomly selected to um, basically be the experimental group and to be called intellectual bloomers. And the teachers were aware of who was an intellectual bloomer and who wasn't. Again, even though in reality, IQ scores of the quote intellectual bloomers were not significantly different than those of the quote normal children. Now here's the amazing part. What they found at the end of the year is first of all, as expected, the children who were labeled as normal children showed an improvement in their intelligence. This is, again, not surprising because we should hope that children's IQ scores, their intelligence, should improve over the course of a whole year of doing school. But what was really interesting is that the children who were labeled as intellectual bloomers showed a massive increase in their intelligence over the course of the year, by the end of the year. So what this means is that teachers were unintentionally uh, aware of who was supposed to be an intellectual bloomer and who wasn't, and so unintentionally treated the intellectual bloomers in a way that prompted and promoted more growth. Okay, and this again happens in research. If we know who's getting the placebo and who's getting the real medication, we may treat those two groups a little bit differently. We may give better overall care, for example, or just treat more positively the people we know have the actual medication versus those who have the placebo. Now, how do we guard against this? Last term for, for this video, how do we guard against this? A double blind design in which neither the researchers nor the participants are aware of who is in the experimental versus the control group. This can be done in a variety of ways, for example, by relying on a third party. I won't get into that, but the point is, if you don't know who's in which group, you can't unintentionally bias the results.